This is Accessing the Pipeline, a podcast for black professionals in private equity and finance brought to you by McGuire Woods. Join host Ruben Pouchet III as he welcomes special guests offering insights into accessing capital, developing and expanding relationships, opportunities, and driving growth for black-owned businesses. Tune in to access the possibilities. All right, welcome to the next installment of Access in the Pipeline. Please join my fellow partner, Dan Howell, and myself uh, in welcoming our guest, Glenn Williams of Wave Capital. Before we get started, Dan, uh, I know this is your first time on the podcast. We have yeah, yeah. you. uh, your much-awaited arrival or, or debut on the podcast. Man, if you want to just give a brief introduction so the folks know, uh, all of our listeners out there know who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Dan Howell. I'm in the Richmond office in Choir Woods. A partner on the M&A team focusing on a broad range of mergers and acquisitions and other corporate transactions, both financial and strategic, uh, you know, and really excited to be doing this pod because we're interviewing a former classmate of mine, Glenn Williams. So, you know, love to see WNL law folks doing great things out in the world. So thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm glad you're with us. And Glenn, man, well, this is, this is mostly about you. Uh, so we'll, <laughs> We'll, we'll just jump right in uh, for all the listeners out there um, that all the first time listeners out there. I'm Ruben Pouchet, partner at McGuire Woods uh, in Chicago. My work is focused on uh, private equity trans- transactions, mostly uh, in the healthcare space. But uh, like like Dan, I have a you know, pretty broad ar- array of transactions in my in my background. So um, ha- happy to happy to help with anything. Um, so, so Glenn, look, jumping right in, man. Let's start by talking about your private equity and investment background, and and, and how that you know sort of led to your decision uh, to start a a, a PE fund. And, and before you answer, I want to make sure that you focus on the fact that you have a JD. Uh, I think it's important for folks to understand how versatile and talented we are with our Juris Doctor degrees. And so, I, I'll stop talking and let you let you jump in. Uh, you're too, you're too kind, Ruben. <laughs> but I, I appreciate you guys for having me on the podcast. Um, it's great to be here, um, and I, and thank you. You know, it's a, it's a great opportunity. But but as you said, I'll, I'll sort of take you through sort of my career trajectory and how I landed in private equity. I was born and raised in Baltimore. I'm a Baltimore guy to the core. Uh, I went to undergrad at Duke University in uh, Durham, North Carolina. After that, I went to to law school at Washington and Lee university where I got my JD. Um, from there, I traveled to Atlanta, um, met my wife, and uh, this is where we set up shop and call home. I started my career at Austin and Bird, and that's sort of where I really got my uh, skills and grinding my teeth in the private equity finance space. So I was in the uh, Austin and Bird finance group, and we've represented uh, institutional lenders, borrowers, private equity companies, and syndicated finance transactions. So we would do LBOs, we would represent the, the lenders and LBOs, we would uh, do dividend recaps and large syndicated loans. From there is where I, I really honed my skills and sort of got really interested in private equity. I was at Alston and Burr for about five years. Then I transitioned to DLA Piper, a partner and I, we actually started the finance department in Atlanta for DLA Piper's um, Atlanta office where we supported the M&A group in private equity M&A transactions. And this is where I really got interested in it. Um, I'll tell you a funny story, Uh, you know, at a big law firm, you know how it is, we're grinding, working, you know, 24, 2,500 hours uh, a year. And uh, one transaction I was doing the funds flow and I saw one of our independent sponsors, an individual, I think he made like $800,000 or something like that directly to his bank account. And so that's, that's with, a light bulb went off in my head and said, hey, I got to get on that side. I got to learn the business and, and really, you know, understand from a business perspective so I can get into that part of the funds flow. And so, uh, you know, from there, I really got into the business side. So I started to network with some of our clients. I started to attend conferences, take classes here and there just to learn the business side of it. And in that in that, in that same route, uh, one of our former clients, he his name's Rashawn Williams. He started a, a family office here based in Atlanta. And so this is where I really was able to contribute on the business side. And we 
were doing a lot of venture capital work at the time. And we, what we called uh, influencer private equity, influencer back private equity, where we would partner with athletes and entertainers, entertainers, some of the big names um, in the entertainment space. And so we would use those big names in the entertainment space to make those introductions into some of the bigger private equity and venture capital funds like Kleiner Perkins, First Round Capital. Uh, we would talk to Josh Koppelman from First Round Capital maybe once a month. And from there, we were able to put real money behind uh, the athletes and entertainers money and to get us into the best deals. And we've done that for about five years. And more specifically, from there, it led to me wanting to do deals all the time. And, uh, and so that's sort of where the advent of Wave Capital Management formed. Um, one of my partners, Abraham Proma, he was a CBRE guy, commercial real estate, and he's since left to, to bring this idea of Wave Capital to life. And he came to me with a deal, actually, and it was a, it was a great deal. It was uh, co-investing at one of the biggest commercial real estate companies in the country. Um, they do a lot of... Uh, really massive deals and they were allowing Abraham to invest alongside them um, in their in their uh, fund at significantly reduced discounts. And so I saw this and I'm like, Abraham, if you don't invest in this, I will invest in this. We should put together a fund in order to invest in this because, you know, institutional investors are already in these deals. If we're in these deals at reduced discounts, I think we can raise money pretty easily. And so he brought that to me and uh, from there, we started up a fund. Uh, we onboarded another partner of, our, of ours, uh, Reese Williams, who is the chief investment officer at Spouting Rock. And uh, Reese does a lot of public equity work. And combination of that, we signed Spouting Rock as a minority owner in our business. So they handle the back end, back office, um, compliance, legal. And we were able to put together this company sort of based on one deal. And so now that we had this one deal, we were able to go out and raise money for it. And then that's sort of the advent of, of Wave Capital. And um, and and so that's where we are now. Nice, nice. But you guys, um, great background. You've, you've obviously you've been outside counsel to private equity funds and, and others in the, the alternative investment space. And then, uh, you know, maybe it was serendipitous that, you, you know, the, it, Abraham brings you this 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 opportunity and that that led you to form Wave Capital, but I, I know that it had to be a little bit more nuanced than that. I mean, what what were some of the indicators, either with you professionally or in the marketplace, that said now is the time for us to do this? Could you walk us through that a little bit? No, absolutely, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, uh, we were doing I was doing uh, a lot of work with family office and venture capital work. And as the market and through COVID sort of slowed down, uh, the IPO space got really dried up. We were doing a lot of SPACs here and there, as you know, the SPAC world kind of dried up. And so we had to shift, sort of shift our focus. And so the family office turned in more into a lifestyle branding uh, type of company. Um, with that company, we, we acquired a, uh, an exotic car business. We acquired a private jet company and as I mentioned before, our clients were uh, high net worth individuals, athletes and entertainers, and, and they, they, they like the, the, the private jets, they like the cars. And so since we already had those companies in our portfolio, we since transitioned the family office into a lifestyle branding company. But my passion always led, led uh, was always around deals and doing deals and private equity. And so I know I didn't wanna do the lifestyle branding stuff, so I was always acquisitive looking for deals. And so um, Abraham and I, we were, we were constantly in, in contact about what deals we can do. I see about 30 to 40 deals a month. Um, and uh, the conversation about Wave Capital, generally it started about, I wanna say two to three years ago. And we all put our heads together to start a fund, but the timing just wasn't right. But with the shift in the market, and high interest rates, we thought we could go into some of these businesses and acquire them for uh, uh, really good multiples since we knew how to raise money and we could put an equity check in front of them. And so this was the time we felt as though uh, it was the, 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 the time was right to strike, you know? And so um, that's, how it did, that's, how it, that's how it all came together. And one of the more, I guess, serendipitous parts is that uh, 
we have a partner, Jerron Davis, and Jerron, he's a whiz kid. Uh, he worked at uh, RLJ, uh, Robert Johnson's uh, private equity fund. He's just finishing up Harvard Business School. I worked with him while I was at DLA Piper, who was one of our clients. And uh, Jerron and I, we've done deals in the past uh, with respect to uh, purchasing some middle market companies. And Jerron was just finishing up Harvard and he was you know, um, in the market for a job. And Jerron and I talked and he was really excited about the opportunity. So we were able to onboard him as well. And so it was like a coming together of uh, just serendipitous moments. Everyone was in a place in their career in which they were in a transition mode. And so that transition mode just kind of gelled everyone together. And we said, hey, we, we have something here. And so that's how Wave Capital was formed. And I have one more question. I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Dan. I think maybe it's a good segue. But you mentioned you're looking at like 30 or 40 deals uh, uh, a month. I mean, how are you sourcing deals? Are you using uh, like, you know, using a broker to, to help send you deal flow? Are you you cold mail and cold call and text it? Like what, what, what's, what's been the greatest source of deals uh, for you? You know, absolutely. You know, I think that's, that's where the strength of wave capital comes in. And that makes us different from a lot of uh, diverse and emerging managers in this space and private equity companies in the space. We don't necessarily work with brokers that often um, because I'm a lawyer. I have a lot of uh, connections within the legal space. Um, you know, I've been, been a lawyer for over 10 years and so it is uh, sort of advantageous to have those connections to law firms and partners that want to do they want to do business with you, you know. And so uh, throughout my connections, lawyers and partners at big firms, they they are always boots on the ground. So they'll call me up and say, hey, we have uh, a company that wants to sell. This is uh, the criteria. Are you interested? And so I have a lot of connections in the legal space with that other Law firms put us on um, a email distribution that we get some of the best deals that come through the law firm at first. But more importantly, it's our founders focused search that we kind of leverage that sets us apart from everyone. And uh, throughout our career, we've really been focused on uh, building relationships with founders and companies. And Jaron specifically at RLJ, he started their founder focus group. And he was able to continue to nurture those relationships. And so for these founder focus groups, we already are plugged in boots on the ground with a lot of these founders of these companies that have, you know, high growth companies or, uh, you know, just really solid companies with a with a great track record. And so this allows us to sort of avoid the uh, bidding wars that sometimes you get with brokers. And so we're able to go to, to, to the companies directly, negotiate good deals and also you know, we keep on management for for a certain amount of time and also develop those relationships. So we have a good relationship with existing managers. And I think that's something that really puts us, sets us apart from a lot of other private equity companies is having that in with those founders of the companies. Appreciate that. But Dan, man, take it away. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think this has been some great background on kind of the genesis of Wave. So I think now I want to kind of step back for a second. If you could give us just like an overview of, you know, what is Wave Capital kind of Think about kind of how you how you would fit or describe it to someone who's never clicked on the website. You know, maybe dive into some of the investment strategies and kind of key pillars that y'all think of. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Wave Capital is a minority owned asset management firm. Um, we were founded uh, last year, twenty twenty three, but we were working on this idea for two or three years, um, and it just came to fruition last year. Uh, we're based in Philadelphia. Um, I'm in Atlanta, but our headquarters is in Philadelphia. We are 60% um, minority owned, and then the other 40% is split between a gentleman named Reese Williams and Spotting Rock Asset Manager. Uh, Spotting Rock has about $600 million in uh, AUM. They touch about $600 billion assets total. Um, and we specialize in crafting tailored solutions for uh, pension funds, endowments, uh, sovereign wealth funds. So we're that's that's sort of our our focus. And we came up with the thesis that throughout the endowments, the pension funds, they have what's called um, uh, diversity mandates, where each pension fund may have to set aside, say, ten percent of their uh, their fund to invest in diverse owned management companies. And we position ourselves directly in that sweet spot where. We're able to not only 
have access to high quality deals. We have the operators with sophisticated knowledge that has been doing this for a while. And we're diverse owned, so we're able to capture all of those all of those um, investment dollars. And so we kind of offer the best of both worlds. But generally, uh, Wave Capital, we, we, we focus in the four sectors. So we have our commercial real estate sector, and this is headed by Abraham. The commercial real estate, we, we invest alongside uh, Class A real estate developers at a discount. Um, and so this has been really uh, advantageous for us, but also our pension fund clients and other uh, high net worth individual clients. Um, we also have a vertical with uh, public equity. And so this is really where Reese Williams shines. Uh, Reese has managed over $2 billion for about 15 years prior. And so we were able to, to bring Reese on to sort of manage our private equity strategy. I mean, our public equity strategy along with uh, a spouting rock. With respect to private equity, I lead that myself as well as Jerron Williams. And so I'll, just, I'll dive deep a little bit deeper into private equity. We, uh, we're raising a $300 million fund right now, but we, we, we typically invest in middle market companies uh, straight through our founder focused group that we've sourced them. We're looking, when I, when I say middle market, we're looking at companies with the EBITDA of at least 4 million. Our equity checks are typically between anywhere between 20 million and 50 million. And we like companies with a history of um, consistent growth and profitability with EBITDA. Um, margins in excess of 20%. And so if, if it hits those, those, plat, those um, criteria, we'll, we'll typically invest. Um, we stay away from distressed and turnaround acquisitions. And uh, we're generally industry agnostic, but we really like the business and industrial services, software, media, entertainment. We stay away from real estate in the private equity vertical since that's, uh, we already have that covered through Abraham. And uh, anything to healthcare related, but we will do uh, healthcare services and things of that nature. Then our last vertical, so our fourth vertical is it's an individual focused type of strategy. And so we partner with a lot of influencers and entertainers just because I, I bring that background as well to uh, create tax uh, advantageous strategies for them. And so we've partnered with um, a few influencers that have a couple hundred thousand followers on Instagram and have really saved them tons of money through our defined benefits plan and other tax strategies. Now, now that's fascinating. You touched on a lot of the, the points that I think would be interesting to our listeners. You know, circling back to the private equity and, and some of the deals that y'all do, it sounds like you're industry agnostic, but it sounded like there were a couple industries that you're more focused on than others, you know, just want maybe want to drill down a little bit more on that. Are there any kind of preferred industries that Wave's looking at and, you know, any ones that you might be looking to pivot into uh, looking into 2024? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we, we really love uh, the business and industrial services. And so this covers electrical companies, plumbing companies, HVAC, fire safety. We recently acquired an electrical services business out in Denver, Colorado, which uh, they were doing about 5 million in EBITDA and we were able to buy it for about a three times multiple. We've since raised EBITDA, I wanna say to six and a half million in the, in the last two years. And so those are the sort of sweet spots. So we, we, we love in, in uh, those businesses where they have a moat around it. And so for instance, in the electrical services business, you need a, a, a master license in order to um, operate those. So that's a natural moat that we put around our business and we're able to partner with operators and, and sort of incentivize existing management to stay on so that we can keep their uh, license and put it to use as well as training other uh, folks in that business to acquire that license. And so that's a natural moat that we like, like around our business. We also like the fact that a lot of these businesses are great businesses. You know, they, they are founded by really hardworking people, uh, really masters of their craft, but they just need that little bit of um, professionalizing of the business in order to make it successful. And so we come in as a partner, uh, we view it as a partner to sort of take that business and elevate it from where it is to where it could be. And a, a couple more questions before I, I kick it back to Ruben. Uh, you know, one, I wanted to, you, you mentioned Reese a few times and Sprout, and I just want to 
just a little bit more information on kind of what the relationships there, you know, what are some of the synergies with that partnership, you know, how do, you know, how do they add value to some of your LPs? Excellent. Yeah. Oh, Spot America has been a, has been a great partner. So they are a minority partner. Chief, Reese is the chief investment officer for Spotting Rock. He's on uh, MSNBC all the time. He, he's the media guy, you know, um, he's been doing it for 30 years, but they add a ton of value. I would say we've been invited to um, some of the big time equity allocator events through introductions through Spotting Rock. We just finished uh, the Marquette Associates Breakfast, which is kind of unheard of for emer emerging managers that's only been around for a year to get invited to. Um, we've had meetings with, uh, upcoming meetings with BlackRock, with um, uh, some other big time allocators. And I think through our partnership with Spouting Rock, it takes a lot of the heartburn um, investors have about working with first time managers. So we're able to assuage some of their concerns. So. The concerns remain, uh, they range from, will these managers just run off with my money? <laughs> do they have a track record? Who's handling compliance? If we do give them money, can they actually service? And can they actually pull off what they're telling us they're going to pull off? And so having Spouting Rock as a back office partner, they're able to um, assuage some of those concerns because they provide us compliance. They provide us with actual research and other resources that we wouldn't be able to get as just a um, emerging manager starting out. And so we're able to sort of uh, jump the line with respect to development of our of our business because we have a, a, a strong backing already. And so that relationship with Spotting Lock and with Reese really helps us get our foot in the door. And then it's on us to actually perform and, and raise the capital. And I would say Reese in particular, he's a he is 30 year veteran in the, in the uh, asset management space. Uh, he has a lot of uh, connections. He's very well respected. And so that just gives us an additional level of uh, uh, security with respect to when we walk into these conversations, we say, hey, we, we are professionals. We um, have experience and here's our track record. So I think it's, it's, it, it helps twofold. No, that's, that's wonderful. But you know, I guess, with all of that background, you know, y'all are still kind of a first time fund, first time managers kind of wanted to get some thoughts on some just kind of challenges, complexities and headwinds that you've seen kind of going through this first time process, a little bit more detail on that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's tough. It's tough. I won't, I won't say it's easy. Uh, we've had very great discussions, but I think the biggest challenge and the biggest headway is nobody wants to be, you know, the first check. Everyone, everyone's like, you know, we, we love this idea, you know, we love everything about it, but let's wait till BlackRock puts a check in. Let's wait till this other company puts a check in. And so nobody wants to be the first, first check. So that, that's, that's a big challenge that, that we're, uh, that we're working through. And we, we've really been able to be creative, um, with, with, with some of our terms and some of our deals in order to, uh, uh, convince folks that, you know, Wave Capital is going to be a premier asset manager in the space um, that we're around for the for the long haul, and uh, that we can get very good alpha returns within this space. Also, just just you know, candidly, being a uh, a black man in this space generally, you don't see min many of us, and so there's always uh, a dance on whether or not to lean into the diversity or not, and so. You'll meet some asset managers that honestly, or or asset allocators that honestly don't care about diversity, and and so it's always trying to uh, uh, walk that that tightrope, um, you know. And we're we're a proud diverse uh, manager, and so we never want to shy away from that, and we embrace in diversity, uh, especially with with the climate going on today. So. Um, with all of those challenges, we're still able to make great, head, great headway in this space. Well, it, that, that's a, another good segue. Um, you know, one of the things that Dan and I and, and some of our other partners have been working, working on very, you know, for the last three years or so um, is building a, an ecosystem of black professionals in private equity and finance. And I, and I think that, you know, one of the spaces where Dan and I tend to see the most traction is with 
uh, black emerging managers and black independent sponsors. I think that what's important for us is, is one, seeing that ecosystem develop. Um, so that it's not just, you know, it's not just the three of us in a room, but it's, it's, it's everybody and thinking about, you know, some of the other folks out there, the, the five CPs and the author capital and, and, um, Apis and Heritage, just some of the other black emerging managers that are, that are out there, you know, I'm starting to see more. It's still not a lot, but what are you seeing in terms of crossing paths with other black emerging managers and where, what are some of the spaces in which you all are interacting with each other? Absolutely. I think, I think we are intentional as you guys are about uh, making those connections with other uh, diverse emerging managers. We are part of the uh, NAIC, the National Association of Investment Companies, uh, which is a, industry trade group uh, specifically designed for not necessarily emerging managers, but diverse managers. And so they equip us with the skills, um, the knowledge, uh, the introductions as well, road shows. And through this ecosystem, we're able to touch a lot of uh, emerging and diverse managers who went through the same and overcome the same challenges that, that we've overcome. And so we've been intentional about really flexing those relationships and coming across those. But just generally, there's not a lot of us in the space. And so once we do find folks in the space, we kind of wrap arms around them and see how can we uh, change the landscape of the space together. And so we're always open to working with other diverse managers um, or anyone just generally that uh, have our mission in mind. And, you know, uh, just generally our, our wave capital, um, we spell it W-A-Y-V-E and uh, wave, it's, it's symbolic, you know, it's... Um, it's our commitment to staying ahead of the curve um, while, you know, navigating the uh, ever-changing tides, agility and, and foresight. And, uh, you know, WAVE stands for way and WAVE. And we're, we're, we're trying to make a new way in this game. You know, we're, we're trying to make a new way in, in, in the asset management space because it's so long been dominated by folks that don't look like us. And so to the extent we can forge those paths and make a new way, while also riding, you know, a powerful wave and, um, you know, creating sort of our own brand along with others. And I think that's, that's, that's sort of our goal. And, uh, to the extent we can do it with, with other folks that look like us, it's just icing on the cake. Nice. Um, and appreciate, uh, you, you mentioned it in AIC shout out to the work that, uh, Rob Green and Carmen, uh, are doing for diverse managers and not just not just the black emerging managers, but also the Asian and Pacific Islander and the Latinx community. I think the the work that they are doing over there is special and I'm glad that you guys are are, are affiliated with them. You know, how do we continue to grow this this ecosystem of, of black emerging managers? I mean, you know, one of the things that we hope to accomplish with the podcast is in part, you know, get, giving a platform to to the diverse managers to, to to talk about the, you know, how they got into this business and the work that they're doing but also to create some awareness amongst, you know, all the, all the B school students and the lawyers out there uh, and the folks that, that are, that are maybe not aware of, or only have been on the fringes of alternative investment. What are, you know, if you had to list your, you know, top one or two things we could do to help build this ecosystem, what would they be? You know, I think, I think awareness is probably the number one, probably, strategy out there. And I say this awareness from, from the jump, you know, uh, going into business school or going into law school, you're, you're not really aware of emerging managers. At least I wasn't. And I think that if we can start to still your, 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 your brand, access the pipeline, you know, starting at law school, starting at uh, business school to just make, you know, diverse students aware that there are other options than you know, graduating and joining a big time law firm, graduating and, and joining a big time um, private equity fund, that there are folks in the industry that are that are forging paths and doing it their own way. And uh, I think having those conversations earlier in folks's career would would set them up for these alternative career paths um, later on down the line. I, I find that it, particularly with lawyers, um, we don't we don't like to make career changes. We don't like the switch. We, you know, we're, we're very, we're a very uh, risk averse group, which, you know, <laughs> is just by our nature. But if I think if 
folks would know and understand that there is a whole vast uh, business community out there that are that are doing deals that are um, you know uh, trying to 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 increase capital that are trying to broaden sort of make the pie bigger and more inclusive. I think that would be a a, a great strategy to to get more diverse managers in this space. Awesome, man. Well, we we appreciate all of the knowledge that you dropped on us today. We know you're you're busy, so we we appreciate your time. Um, typically, we like to close out each uh, each episode of, of Access to the Pipeline by asking our guests the same sort of series of questions. And so, Dan and I will we'll, we'll take turns uh, on this on on the closeout. But I'll, I'll fire away with the first one, and we'll we'll just keep going. But what's one book that you might recommend? Uh, to our listeners that's been transformational uh, in your career? Oh, man, I would say there's so many, man. I'm, I'm an avid reader. <laughs> so uh, I would say um, I would say a book. It's, it's not a, it's not a business book, but it's a book called Letting Go, um, The Pathway of Surrender by David Hawkins. And this has been transformative, not only in my career, but in my life. It's uh, it's about facing challenges, dealing with challenges and, and letting go and, and moving forward. And uh, there is something liberating and freeing to know that, you know, challenges, hard times is a part of life. It's part of the human experience. And so once you change your perspective on certain things, you can try to kind of change your life. So, uh, and then you understand that the I can'ts of the world, that I can't do this, I can't be successful, are really just I won't. And so once you change your perspective on those things and uh, every experience is a learning experience, then you kind of you just kind of take back your own power and understand that, you know, it's your reactions to things in the world that um, that sort of dictate how you feel. And so once you put yourself in that power position, then um, then you're unstoppable, man. Yeah, it sounds like a powerful book. Uh, yeah. Questioning two, is there a cocktail or, or other drink or meal that best describes your personality? Oh, man. Uh, I usually drink old fashions, but I will say I am not old fashioned. <laughs> other than the type of music I listen to, man. I, I like Earth, Wind & Fire. You know, my dad raised me on the old school uh, music. But I, I would say I would say seafood, uh, crabs, crab cakes. I'm, I'm from Baltimore, Baltimore to the heart. And so I would say that. Uh, a nice, you know, Maryland crab, you know, bushel of crabs with the, uh, 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 you know, uh, just dumped on the table and everything like that. Getting my hands dirty because I like to get my hands dirty. I like good food. Um, you know, I think that best describes my, my personality. And, and you eat crabs with other people. I'm a, I'm a people person. And so I think that best describes my personality. So, so look, I, I don't want any problems on my podcast, but, That's you know, right. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and I think we do. I think we do crab boils, uh, aka the Low Country boil, a little better than the Baltimore. But we'll hey, we'll, hey, we'll, man, we'll save that for another day. <laughs> hey, I, I love Savannah too, man. I, I've tried those Low Country boils, and you know, don't don't tell my Baltimore people, but they're chef's kiss. There we man. go. There we go. <laughs> uh, if you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? Oh man, uh, I would have to pick a guy named his name. His name's Sri Ramana Maharshi, and uh, he was a, uh, I would say, a Hindu um, sort of teacher. And this guy, incredible life, man. He had a near-death experience when he was about 10 or 11, and that sort of prompted him to uh, go out and uh, seek a life of solitary, um, a solitary life, but he actually was what they call enlightened in, in, in his spiritual beliefs. But, uh, he, he, he had the key to happiness. He, you know, he was, um, not materially wealthy or anything like that, but folks followed him because he, he sort of figured it out. And so that I always keep him in my mind because regardless of, um, you know, how my career goes, any material, uh, wealth that I get, I always try to really remember that, you know, happiness is, is what you create within and how you feel about it internally. And so if you're, if, if you have that, the ups and downs of life can come and go, um, you know, and you, and you have that joy inside. So I would, I would love to meet with him, pick his brain and, uh, just have a conversation with him. Yeah. Nice. 
And lastly, what's the single best piece of advice you've received from a mentor, whether personally or professionally? Oh, man. Uh, I would say the single best advice was probably, probably from my dad. And he told me when I was younger, I had to be in high school and I, I played, uh, I played football in high school. And so I was popular, um, at the time. And, um, he told me, he said, Glenn, always look out for the underdog, you know, never use, uh, any status or any influence you have to, um, pick or uh, demean people that are below you. So he said, always look out for the underdog and you'll never go wrong for that. If you look out for the folks that are the lowest in our society, it, it lifts all ties, you know? And so that is probably the single best um, piece of advice that he's given me. Awesome, man. Before we close out, I want to make two two quick points. One, you're downplaying your, your football career. Uh, by not mentioning that you 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 also play Division One football at a high level, uh, which which leads into my second comment, which is, you know, a testament to how small the world really is. I met Glenn maybe about four or five years ago, sitting at the bar at the Ritz Carlton in, or in Orlando, Florida, and we just you know randomly struck up a conversation, and about five minutes into the conversation. Uh, we, re we, we realized that Glenn used to be roommates with uh, one of my really good friends from Savannah, Georgia, Eron Riley, uh, who also played at, played football at Duke. And it's just, it just goes to show you one, you know, don't miss opportunities to have conversations with, with, with really good people generally Two, expect full circle moments like this, because who knew five years ago that we'd all end up on this podcast together after having gone to school, going to law school with Dan and, and, and meeting me randomly. And so, so it's a really cool full circle moment to have you on the podcast. We appreciate you so much. Thank you to all the listeners for, for tuning in to Access in the Pipeline. Go check out uh, Wave Capital. Uh, pay attention to what they're doing because we're, we're fully, uh, fully expecting them to make, make waves in this industry. Thanks everyone. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Accessing the Pipeline. To learn more about today's discussion, please email host Ruben Pouchet III at rpusha at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This series was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this series, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this installment. The views, information, or opinions expressed are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This series should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action. 